from Microbe TV. This is Above the Noise for May 9th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Good morning, Vincent. Good to have you, Paul. You write a column on Substack called Above the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. I'm really enjoying these articles, and I thought we should make a video version of each post. What do you think about that idea? Let's give it a try. I'm all for it. All right. So today I'd like to take a closer look at one of your latest posts called Nasal Spray COVID Vaccines, Hope or Hype? Maybe we could start by having you explain what is a nasal spray vaccine. Right. So uh, flu mist, for example, is a nasal spray vaccine. So that's a vaccine that is administered by the nasal root um, with the goal of hopefully inducing uh, an immune response, which is protective and in theory, more protective than a vaccine that would be administered parenterally. So with influenza, it hasn't really worked out that way. The influenza vaccines given as a shot are really as effective as the influenza given as nasal spray for all manner of illness, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe illness. There really are no clear differences. So in your article on this, you describe uh, what these are and what, what the hopes for them are. In fact, the Biden administration is providing some funding for people to develop uh, a nasal spray vaccine for COVID, right? Right. So their so-called next gen project is a five billion dollar project that in part includes um, monies to try and develop uh, a nasal spray vaccine, a universal vaccine, as well as therapies. And you write in the article, caution should reign. Why do you say that? At the very least, uh, I think, you know, if you think about it for a second, what does a vaccine provide? When you look at this vaccine, which was launched in December of 2020, the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines were launched in December 2020. And, and at the time, protection against mild, moderate and severe disease was excellent. It was 95 percent across the board. Six months later, um, studies showed the protection against severe disease was holding up. It was still about 95 percent. Protection against mild disease had dropped to, not to 50 percent. So why was it so good back in December? And the answer is those were three-month trials. Those participants had just gotten their second dose. So they still had high levels of immunoglobulin in the bloodstream and arguably still had, had uh, some immunity even at mucosal services, arguably. But in any case, six months later, it was gone. And I think that that was a seminal moment in trying to communicate what one could expect from this vaccine. Because there was an outbreak um, in Provincetown, Massachusetts uh, in, in July of 2021. So thousands of men get together. They celebrate the July 4th holiday. Um, many are vaccinated, about 80% are vaccinated. Nonetheless, there's an outbreak. 346 men get COVID. Four were hospitalized. That's a hospitalization rate of 1.2%. The remaining 342 had a mild or asymptomatic infection. That's good. That's a vaccine that's working well. That's the best you could expect. And that was a moment when the CDC really should have stood back and trumpeted how well this vaccine was working. But in many ways, the opposite happened. Because when they published an article in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, this was their article. The title of the article included the word breakthrough. In other words, they described those asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infections as breakthrough infections. The term breakthrough implies failure. This wasn't a failure at all. It was a remarkable success. And I think from then on, when we started to use phrases like waning immunity, we weren't explaining what we meant by that. Did we mean waning protection against mild disease, which had to happen because that's based on uh, antibody responses, which are invariably short lived. And as distinct from T cell responses or memory B cell responses, which are much longer lived. And that's why you get protection against severe disease with these short incubation period mucosal infections, but not protection against uh, mild disease for any real length of time. So what is the hope for a COVID nasal spray and why would so much money be invested into developing one? 
Well, the hope is that by administering it uh, intranasally, that you would induce an IgA response at the mucosal surface that would be longer lived than than the current than the, the current vaccines that you're seeing. But if you take a step back and think about this for a second, um, natural infection also induces excellent protection against severe disease for what appears to be a long period of time. But it doesn't induce excellent protection against mild disease for any length of time. Now, the, the natural infection essentially is a, is a nasal immunization. I mean, when you're naturally infected, you acquire that virus from small droplets that, that are emanating from the nose or mouth from someone who's infected. That enters your, your, your uh, nasal passage, the upper respiratory tract. And so you induce a very good IgA response following a natural inspe- infection, which, which in terms of protection against mild disease is short lived. So the thinking, which doesn't make a lot of sense is that by giving a nasal spray vaccine, that would do better than natural infection, which I think is a lot to ask. Do you think that someone could develop a way that made the IgA last longer in the mucosal surfaces than it does not naturally? So you could make something up. You could argue, for example, why don't we take um, this this whatever vaccine we're going to use, whether it's messenger RNA or it's a vectored virus vaccine or it's a purified protein vaccine um, or a whole killed viral vaccine as is used in China and microencapsulated and then have these these capsules sort of enter nasal associated lymphoid tissue, so-called NALT, and then kind of uh, via this time release mechanism, uh, have some of these capsules released over three months or six months or a year or two years. So you're constantly stimulating the upper respiratory tract um, to induce an IgA response. I'm not sure you want to do that. I, I would worry about <laughs> something like that, frankly. Yeah, we we our vaccines currently don't do that. And even infections, for the most part, don't do that. So it seems counter to the way the immune system has evolved. Yes, I, I, I think... Um, we should pay attention to, to what the, the immune system wants to apparently do. What, what it wants to do is it wants to protect us against serious illness. It wants to keep us out of the hospital. It wants to keep us out of the intensive care unit. It wants to keep us out of the morgue. Um, but it's willing to tolerate mild infections. And you could argue that a mild infection, especially here with SARS-CoV-2, means that you're being, uh, that you're, you're being exposed to all four viral proteins and, and you're having a, a broader T cell response because you're looking at T cell epitopes, both cytotoxic and, and uh, T helper cell epitopes on all four proteins that in, in many ways you're better off. Um, and so um, I think we should be, we're going to have to be willing to live with mild illness for decades, if not longer, to come with this virus. And I think we're we're not quite accepting that. It's worth pointing out that one of the best mucosal vaccines, at least in my opinion, oral polio virus vaccine, which you take by mouth, virus reproduces in your intestinal mucosa, right? Different location, but still a mucosal surface. That protection against uh, infection only lasts a few months, uh, and then it declines. And then if you encounter a polio virus, uh, it will reproduce for a few days until the memory kicks in and limits uh, reproduction and shedding. So uh, just looking at what we have out there should be informing uh, what we're thinking about. You're right. I mean, I, I've worked for uh, about a quarter of a century on rotaviruses. And when I first entered the field back in the early 1980s and started reading about it, it became very clear to me that babies who were infected with rotavirus early in infancy, when they then were exposed later in life, a year later, two years later, they were protected against moderate to severe disease, but not against mild infection. So what, what that initial infection did is it modified the severity of disease associated with re-exposure, but it didn't, didn't uh, eliminate infection or mild disease. The same thing's true for respiratory syncytial virus, another short incubation period of mucosal infection. These COVID nasal vaccines are being promoted widely, in particular by a lot of people who are immunologists. Uh, and I don't understand why they're saying this is a game changer when basic immunology tells us otherwise. Do you have any insight into that? No. <laughs> yeah, I figured you were going to say that. The only, I mean, I, I, I think that when you're working on that, um, you know, we're scientists, we, we hope for the best and often expect the worst. But, and I think those who comment on it, and I, you know, I think we can both name them. It's, uh, it's what you hope will be true, but certainly it seems to go against what, 
um, we know to be true just biologically. And I guess what, what worries me a little bit in this is when this project next gen is kind of compared to Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed um, basically bet on six horses to win one race. Um, but but the technologies that was used, were used, whether it was mRNA vaccines or purified protein vaccines or vectored virus vaccines, you had a lot of reason to believe that was going to work. And, and it did, I mean, in, 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 uh, for several of these vaccines. But here, when you're trying to, to do something that I think biologically seems to go against what happens under natural conditions or with previous vaccines, I think um, that is not Operation Warp Speed. It's something far more hopeful than that. And I think the good news about, about this $5 billion program is hopefully we'll learn things um, in this that we hadn't expected uh, that, will, that will help out. But I, I, do, I do think that we should view these nasal spray vaccines with caution. All right. So that was going to be my last question. Do you think the, the money that is allocated for this work, do you think it's wasted or are we always going to learn something in science? Do you think it's worth uh, spending on it? Yeah, uh, ask me that three years from now, but I, I, I hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll uh, learn something from this. And at the very least, what we may learn is what are reasonable expectations for this and to accept what vaccines can and can't do. And I think we, we um, created a, a, a sense of disappointment in this country. I think when, for example, in July 2021, when we described these infections as breakthrough infections, I remember because I ended up being on CNN a fair amount during the um, this pandemic. I just remember that uh, on one segment, they were, they were discussing uh, Brett Kavanaugh having had an asymptomatic infection just as a screening for being on the Supreme Court. And if you watched the way that was carried on TV, you would have thought he was fighting for his life because of the use of the word breakthrough. So, you know, people thought, you know, it's here, here the CDC told me to get this vaccine. I've gotten two doses of this vaccine, and now I have a mild illness. The CDC lied to me. And, and it's, uh, I think we created this unrealistic expectation with this vaccine, and we've suffered that. I think that's a great point. This Provincetown outbreak was a, an opportunity, as you said, to really convey a good message, and the CDC just didn't do that, unfortunately. Right. So today, as we're recording, you released part two of, uh, of this series on uh, nasal spray vaccines, and we will cover that uh, on the next time we record. How's that for a plan? Sounds good. Thank you. You can find Paul Offit at Above the Noise on Substack. We'll have a link uh, to that in the show notes for this episode. That's Above the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.